In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Truly is risen. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, as we see in today's Gospel, St. John is continuing the topic that Jesus had started while he was preaching in the synagogue of Capernaum. So he is continuing on the mystery of, of the Holy Communion. But as we see, many of the Jews were in, in, indignant, and even some of his disciples, when he was talking about his flesh and his blood, he said, if you do not eat my flesh and you don't drink my blood, then you don't have life. Because, and here, he's bringing God. Because the Jewish, they had to say, they, if it was something seriously related to the, the religion or whatever, they had, uh, they had to bring God as an evidence. Right? I swear by the living God. Right? This was their fault or whatever. So when he said, by the living God, through God I have life, and you and all those who will partake from my body and my blood will have life eternal. Right? Not, not like those that ate the manna in the wilderness. They ate and they still died. But those who will eat my flesh and drink my blood will have life eternal. So it's not a simple thing. And as I told you, those stories and many, and many other stories about the Holy Communion, many, many different, uh, different people had different vision about the Holy Communion. Some of them, as we saw that pious woman, she saw the burning charcoal. Right? Others saw pieces of meat. There was a, a Muslim during the, uh, the occupation in Greece. He was watching what the priest is doing. And he was seeing that he's taking a baby, putting it on the holy table, and cutting it, cutting it in in pieces and he was terrified he was terrified imagine to to see something like that so and uh, when after he he followed at the end he didn't say a word but he was watching till the end that the the priest got in pieces and put it uh, in the chalice and after was giving to each one, and at the end, the, the baby was alive, surrounded by the angels, and went up. This, what is going on? How, how, how this can be? Like, it's impossible. I saw with my eyes that they cut it in pieces, they ate him, and now he's alive, right? So how can you explain this thing? And he went to the priest and said, what you're doing here? I, I don't understand. I literally saw you doing that. And after I saw, and the priest was amazed. said, see, God discovered you, his mystery. He showed what others cannot see. Because even, even now in our days, like, for example, the Protestants, they are saying that these words are metaphorical. But we know that this is truly, it's not the bread and the wine. It's for us because imagine if it was truly blood and raw meat, I think no one would would be able to have the to have the courage to come forward to partake, right? But see again the greatness of God, of God that He transforms it for us in such a way that we can approach. Of course, with fear of God, love and faith. But this takes, again, takes preparation. 
were not coming, like running over right right away. So because this had happened and uh, are still happening. I remember one summer I was in the cathedral in uh, in Athens, and you know during the summers usually the, the the doors are open and you can see outside. So when I I was coming with the holy gifts, I see a guy smoking and running. So he came, stands, stand in line, and to take communion. <laughs> I said uh, when he got closer, I said, listen. Stay on the side, I'll talk to you at the end. Oh, he started screaming. Oh, you're like, I came here to take communion. And you're like, yeah, you're shaming me in front, in front of the people. I didn't say anything. He said, just on the side. That's all, all I said. Oh, he, he left nervous. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to the metropolis tomorrow. Uh, and so on and so forth. See, so he, yes, he went to the, my bishop the next day. And he explained him... Uh, what uh, what I said because I said after he started arguing with me I said listen this is not uh, the bowl uh, of soup at your your home you know this is the body blood body and blood of Jesus and uh, the bishop explained to him said listen you had to to be fasting you had you, you had to um, to, to take confession, uh, to do your canon prayers, and after you approach, but you're running, <laughs> like literally with with a cigar in your mouth, you know, it's like, and you're going to take Christ. How can you? Like, there is no room for Christ, right? If if you have the demons literally in your mouth and you're running, it's, then it's a conflict of interest. So, anyways, afterwards he came and. Uh, he asked for forgiveness, and even I became his spiritual father later, but we had that, that issue in the beginning. So the, this is what we have to have in mind. When we are listening, and many, many, many people, uh, like for example, in the beginning, the first Christian era, the Romans, they were searching where are the Christians to see, to catch them how they are eating, the flesh of whatever. Because this is what we're preaching, that we are eating the flesh of God, right? So, and they they wanted to catch them to see how they are eating the, the, the raw flesh and drinking the raw blood. So, of course, not, now everybody understands that it's, uh, it's the transformation that has had the, the metamorphosis of the bread and the wine into the true blood and the body and blood. But back then they had no idea. They weren't that educated. They didn't have all this information. Uh, they didn't have access to all this information that we do today, right? Today we have access to any information we, we need to. So, and of course it's a sin for us after 2000 years still to have these issues. But anyways, there are still people that uh, are thinking that uh, the Orthodox Christians are weird because they are uh, communing with uh, uh, flesh and and blood. So, um, of course, there's those that have no idea what is going on. But there's still some some individuals, some smarties that they have no idea what's going on. All right, so, and uh, another thing that I wanted to share with you today is uh, that we are celebrating two very, two great saints of our church, Saint Cyril and Methodius. They were two brothers from Thessalonica. Both of them, they were very highly educated. They knew, they were speaking eight or nine languages freely, right? Imagine in 800s, they were born in the early 800s. I think Methodius was the, the, the oldest one, 
he was born in uh, in 815 or 17 and uh, Cyr uh, Cyril was seven years younger than uh, Methodius so their father was a general in the army so they both both were very highly educated and Methodius actually was in the army for a while Cyr uh, Cyril he went directly to the monastery in Constantinople uh, he actually was the student of Saint Potius, the Patriarch of Constantinople. So, and um, they both started preaching after Methodius had quitted from the army. He joined his brother, and they both were became, became monks, and they started preaching from all from the Moravia, the countries that we know today, Croatia, Slovakia, Serbia, uh, go to, went to Ukraine, Poland, and Russia. So they are the ones that created the Slavonic alphabet, the one that still is used today in the church. So they, because they had this great knowledge of languages, so they translated, they created the alphabet, they translated the Old and New Testament in Slavonic and they started preaching and baptizing in one after one sermon uh, they baptized 250 people right away right so and of course after exactly after 100 years it, it became the baptism of the entire Russian land but see all this was the beginning they had planted the seed and the seed that they had planted brought forward fruit so that's why our church co it's uh, remembering them commemorating them, them and they are the equal with the apostles because they did the same uh, work and even though uh, Cyril, after they returned from Russia, they went to Rome. Then we still were together, we're in communion. Uh, he, Cyril died in Rome, and uh, Methodius was in prison for two, for two years. But after that, he didn't go back, but he continued preaching. All right, so they did their job they answer to the, the high calling to the end of their life so even even though they had to go through difficulties they didn't give up as some individuals today you know even though they are seeing that there is a wrong thing right as we saw with the council in uh, in Crete in Colimbari and uh, other things that are going on, no, nobody says a thing because they are afraid of their position. So, but see, these two wonderful and great saints of our church, they did not think. And all the saints, starting from the disciples of Christ, holy fathers, martyrs, and so on and so forth, till our days I'm not saying that in our days there aren't people that are following Christ and preaching the word of, of Christ they are but unfortunately it's a minority the biggest percentage they are going with the flow where the wind blows everybody goes that direction so but as Orthodox Christians we shouldn't go that way we should stand up for the truth, protect the truth, because we all are called, each one of us, we have the calling. We all are baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity. So we cannot say that, oh, I'm not a priest. It doesn't matter. You're still baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity. We're not asking you to, be, to become a priest. 
if you have this calling, you're welcome. But you still have the duty of a Orthodox Christians to protect the mysteries, the dogmas, and the holy tradition that you receive. So no one is excused by this. Oh, my lay people, you know, let the priest, let the clergy do it. No. Each one, we are members, because it's not only your heart, heart or your brain that works. All them, the members of your body cooperate, they work together, right? So your brain gives the message to your hands and your hands are working, right? Your, your feet are walking or running or whatever you need to do. So your stomach is digesting and so on and so forth. So everything works together. So the same thing in our community, in our society. We work together. So you cannot say that, oh, it's, it's not my job. It's not my responsibility. Yes, it is each one and everybody's responsibility because we are one whole. So with this saying, my dear brothers, then let us be spiritually awake and follow the commandments of Christ and partake this heavenly bread and blood. Not as those, even though they were his followers, when they heard this, they left him. They turned away. And Jesus asked the other disciples, are you going to leave me too? They said, no. The words you have are eternal, are life-giving. And we know that you are the Messiah, you are the Christ. So see, again, there are people that we see and we understand that the only source of life, the only source of surviving. There is no other source. There is no other protection. As the people think that they're thinking that this vaccine is going to save them. <laughs> well, if, if this vaccine is so good, so why, why then these people that are vaccinated cannot donate blood? It's simple like that, right? You cannot donate blood if you're vaccinated, okay? So see that there are small things, but they are very important for us to understand. So do not fail for that. The only protection, the only vaccine is this, the true, the body and blood of Christ. This is our protection. This is our source of life. And this is what we need. Today, I went to the doctor and the doctor asked me if I'm, I, I am vaccinated. I said, that I got a shot yesterday. I'm going to take another one today. <laughs> <laughs> so he looked at me weirdly. Probably he did not understand what I said. <laughs> I don't care. You know? So, but this is, this is our vaccine. So let us think and let us stay faithful to our Lord, to his commandments, to his church, and follow him to eternal life. Amen. God bless you all, and Christ is risen.